tonight's Taylor Series program, the Green Mountain Club, which is the group that actually started, built, and maintains the Lawn Trail from Massachusetts all the way up to Canada and across from the Appalachian Junction over to Hanover, uh, puts on a series of Taylor Series programs that are generally something about hiking or adventure. And we are one of the few sections that does them south of Route 2. So I'm <laughs> glad to see you all coming out, because I think there's a lot of people south of Route 2 who want to participate. We have on the back table some information about the club and also about our effort to replace the tower on the summit of Bromley. And if you're interested afterwards, please feel free to go over and look at that. And also, if you are not a member of the club and are interested, there's some flyers about joining the club. The club does all the meetings on the entire lawn trail system. It's about 450 miles of trail maintenance our weather has gotten more violent and more and more hikers are out there, it becomes harder to maintain your trail bed because of increased erosion. So the more members we have supporting us, whether it's simply financially as a member or coming out with sweat equity, the better chance we have of keeping this trail around for the next hundred years. It's about 115 years old now. So, Tonight's speaker, Preston Bristow, is a past president of the Green Mountain Club, is the chair and has been for years of our um, land management committee, and was one of the two people who were the first caretakers out at Stratton Town <coughs> when we started the caretaker program in the 70s. And he and Lee Allen had the pleasure of spending two years out there cleaning it up after about 50 years of people not treating it kindly. But they really helped to get it on the way of being the way it is now. If you've been out to Stratton Pond, it's a pleasure to go out there. He has um, done this show a few other times, is well versed in the rail trails that have become part of the long trail system. And so I'm gonna turn this over to him now. Thank you, Marge. Um, I'm overwhelmed. This is a great turnout. Uh, I've not had a crowd like this before. And I do want to emphasize before I start, I'm just a guy. Uh, you might, you know, some people have said, are you a historian? Have you written a book? No, I'm just a guy. Uh, I have a long history with the Green Mountain Club, long history with hiking. I happen to love railroads. And when I learned that there were logging railroads in southern Vermont, uh, and that uh, when the Long Trail was first established, uh, starting, oh, I think here the Bennington section was laying out some trail in 1914. Um, I just said, this is really fascinating. I want to know more about it. So I have uh, prepared a slideshow. I, I can't guarantee you that I'll answer all your questions. Um, because I'm not the expert, but there's some fun pictures here, and I'll also tell you some of my sources of where I got things. And my goal is to keep the program fairly short, and uh, then if you have more questions or whatever, we can, we can talk about that at the end. Um, Marge mentioned my friend Lee Allen, so this is myself and Lee Allen 40 years ago at Stratton Pond, when we were caretakers there, one of those classic old signs that now that it's National Forest, they don't look like that anymore. But we do miss that era. Um, there were four logging railroads in southern Vermont that um, the Long Trail um, uses. And they are the uh, Bennington and Glastonbury Railroad, which later became the Bennington and Woodford Electric Trolley, the Deerfield Railroad, and the Rich Lumber Company Railroad. Um, the, I guess that's the way the slide got formatted at the bottom, is just simply saying that although the Long Trail was first conceived of in 1910 um, through Southern Vermont, it's basically been in existence since 1914. 
I'm not going to dwell on the map. The map is just to get you a sense, but um, today the Long Trail is in green. Uh, this is the Deerfield River Railroad, comes out of Wilmington. This is the Bannington and Glastonbury Railroad out of Bannington up to um, Glastonbury Mountain. And then the Lybrook Railroad out of Manchester. So the original Long Trail followed significant parts of the Deerfield, okay, Deerfield River Railroad along here. It also followed significant parts of this and it also went to Bourne Pond and followed this. So uh, you can see that it's changed quite a bit over the years. Um, there's a guy named Bill Gov. He's still alive, but I think he's 91 years old now. Lives in Williamstown. Um, he wrote a great book on logging railroads in the Adirondacks. He wrote a great book on logging railroads in New Hampshire. He never wrote a book about logging railroads in Vermont. Um, I wish he had, because there's no if you went to the bookstore and said, I want a book on logging railroads in Vermont, you're not going to find one. And yet a lot of the pictures that I use come from the Bill Gov collection at the uh, uh, Vermont Historical Society. Uh, a guy named Tyler Resch wrote a book on the Glastonbury, which talks about the Glastonbury uh, and Bennington Railroad. Uh, there was a fellow named Brian Donaldson who wrote two volumes on the Deerfield River Railroad. He was going to write a third volume, but then his health caught up with him, and I believe he's died, uh, and the books are out of print, although you can always go to Amazon and pay $100 if you want to. The Rich Lumber Company, which I find the most fascinating, um, which is the one out of Manchester, it's sometimes called the Lybrook Railroad. There's a chapter uh, in it in Rails in the North Woods. There's you know, a nice article in the Rutland News Liner, which is a magazine for rail fans. No book on it. Also, Robert Jones, who, who is a true historian, did a pictorial of Vermont railroads, and some of the pictures I use come from that. Again, another book out of print. And then these are the long trail guides. The one on the left, the 1917 one, is uh, uh, a, a real kick. It's, it's, uh, it was pre-car, so they were talking about how to get to the trail with buckboards and stage coaches and riding railroads. It's really quite funny. Um, I actually wrote an article for the Long Trail News, which is on the left, and also for the Wil Wilumsic Review on the right back in uh, 2014. And I um, gave a few talks after that. Then nothing happened. And then last fall, I was um, participating in a work group for Tucker Johnson Shelter, and I overheard Marge Fish say that um, they might have to cancel their Taylor series because they didn't have a speaker. So I said, well, I got this slide. I can dress up this old uh, PowerPoint. So anyway, that's here, here we are. Um, there's a one half mile stretch of railroad bed on the uh, Bennington and Glastonbury that served for seven years as an optional route of the Long Trail. They don't, we don't have optional routes anymore, but they used to. Uh, six years as a side trail, and then 41 years as the main route for the Long Trail. And this is not the greatest picture, but it's the only one that I have been able to find when it was actually a logging railroad that was run by steam. And it's probably at the end of the line. You can see that there's a Rutland car there. They are actually pushing picnickers on a, on a um, flatbed up, up the mine. These logging railroads were extremely steep going up because all they had to do was push up empty and then they came down full. Um, and so that, that's the only picture that I have been able to locate of that rail line uh, with an actual steam engine on it. When they converted it to a trolley line, then they had to take the heavier rails out, put lighter rails in and put overhead wires. So um, this had to have been before the trolley. Here's one picture of a trolley car. The charcoal kilns are fascinating. Um, this friend of mine, Lee Allen, he, he has, he's, a, he, he's a PhD forester and uh, has, is a historian also, and he has found it very fascinating researching the charcoal kilns because these things were way out of nowhere, but it, there was money to be made. And, um, but the kilns oftentimes predated the railroad and they were serviced by horse and wagon. 
but here the trolley car goes by it. There's three trolleys. You can see the kiln in the back from a different angle, and you can see the uh, electric wires overhead. Up in Glastonbury, there was a logging camp up there. They converted it. They uh, built a Glastonbury Inn. There's the trolley coming up. All that's gone now. If you go up there, you, you'd be pretty hard pressed to find anything. That same inn is on your right. The um, so-called clubhouse and pavilion is on your left. The inn actually had a casino as well. You can see, uh, let's see if I can get, you can see people on the bridge. You can see the trolley here. Uh, and then uh, this is Bowles Brook. Um, if you look at Bowles Brook, you can see how stony it is. Um, this was a, a, a f enormous financial loss. They built this whole complex up there, and then they had a flood, ripped the whole rail line out, and they decided it wasn't worth uh, uh, replacing the rail line, and it just, it just disappeared. This is something called uh, Camp Comfort, and the trolley you can see on the left goes right by the building. Uh, there was a series of buildings up there. I, you know, I told you I'm just a guy. I'm not an expert. I still don't know quite how they all related to each other, but um, uh, that's Camp Comfort. Uh, <laughs> some wags have said these are pretty dour-looking guests for going up to a casino. Maybe they didn't do well. Uh, you can, this is Camp Comfort again. You can see the tracks go right by the building to the left there. But, uh, that was, that was the era back then. You dressed up in your finest and took a trolley up into the woods, and there they are. Um, this is a pretty poor picture, but it does kind of show you, again, you know, people dressed to the nines in the trolley. All right, we'll move on to the Deerfield River Ra Railroad. The long trail was rerouted to follow a three-mile portion of the northern Deerfield River Road line following its abandonment in 1919, and it remained there for 10 years until 1930. The uh, Deerfield Railroad was a uh, narrow gauge, um, but I guess this is one place I can just say um, there were very extensive railroads in the White Mountains. There are very extensive railroads in the Adirondacks. Um, Vermont is not known for its railroads, but the Deerfield Railroad is actually the longest logging railroad of all those three mountain ranges. Um, it, uh, I think it had something like 30 miles of track at one point. Uh, it was really quite extensive. It was uh, started by a guy named Amos Blandon, who was quite a character, and um, he uh, really had hoped after the logging was done that it would become a common carrier and people would settle up there and the railroad would continue to serve them. And although the terrain on, on, uh, up, if you know up there, is fairly flat, it's nearly 2,000 feet high and it just, the growing seasons just weren't good enough. People tried to farm up there and they just couldn't do it. But this is White Barn Flats. The last picture was White Barn Flats also. different crew pose, you can see that trestle in the back, or not trestle, but bridge. Um, horseshoe curve is another feature of that rail line. Uh, they used the rail line to build the Somerset Reservoir and then later the Harriman Reservoir, and you can, this is a pose here and the reservoir is on the left. Uh, this is a shea. Those of you that are familiar with railroads, a, a shea has these up and down pistons here. Most trains have pistons that go this way. It allows them to climb really steep pitches. Mountain Mills was the place where all of the lumber was sawed and stacked. And this was uh, near Wilmington. Uh, most of Mountain Mills, I think, is underwater now with Harriman Reservoir. But that was the approach to it. Uh, you can see they employed a lot of people. It was a big deal. So that was the uh, planning mill and the stacking yard. Again, they're all gone. It, 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 this, this photo is rather fun because you've got people lying down, people standing on the coupling, people posing. It, it's really, they, uh, they had a good time with this picture. 
And then there's the Lybrook Railroad, which I find the most fascinating, which is the one that comes out of Manchester here. Um, the long trail went by Bourne Pond for many, many years, 54 years. Um, it was relocated uh, when Lybrook became a federal wilderness, and there was some feeling that the trail was bringing in too much use to, to Bourne Pond. Uh, I always regretted that. I will say, you know, I'm, I'm kind of stream of consciousness here, but as I, remind, I think of things, I'll mention them. A lot of people say, I don't understand why the White Mountains are wilderness, the Adirondacks are wilderness, this part of the Green Mountains is wilderness, and there were railroads in it. Well, the reason why is because these railroads were in the late 1800s and early 1900s. They didn't have trucks then, and it was just too far to get to by horse. So the most remote areas had, had railroads. So even though it seems inconsistent that a wilderness would have such a, an intense activity as a railroad, it was because these lands were so incredibly uh, hard to get to. Um, the area they wanted to reach is called the East Mountain Plateau. This is a picture from the Stratton Mountain, that's Stratton Pond. Uh, the plateau is just that, it's very flat up there, but it's also about 2,000 feet in height and you, they had to get out of Manchester to get there. And I guess this is a point for me to start to say, it's fascinating, the Deerfield River Railroad, it came up from Wilmington from the south, it, it followed the Deerfield River drainage, it, it got to that plateau, but the town of Manchester wanted the business. And so they talked, a, a company called Rich Lumber Company that had had successes in the Adirondacks to access that area and put up a, a mill in Manchester. And also the Rutland Railroad wanted the business. And so they, the only way to do that was to build a rail line that went through the Lybrook Canyon up to that plateau. And it is just astounding to me that anyone could think they could do that. They did do it. They lost money at it, but they did do it. They had to build a whole bunch of trestles. This one's a trestle made out of uh, sawn lumber. But you know, here there's a switchback, and you get the sense of just how it's just clinging to the cliff sides way up there. Um, this is the switchback from another angle. You can see how incredibly steep that is. Uh, um, I told you that they could go uphill empty and come down with a full load, but you had to hold back that full load. And, and they, there were some accidents where people, they lost traction and, uh, you know, and they, they had a hard time stopping. Here's another one of those trestles. Uh, you know, it's, it's a shea and it says this whistle's, this, uh, whistles wide open. That just means that that whole plume of smoke there. Um, I, I, I've tried to walk parts of the rail line. You know, it, it's fascinating. So little is visible now, but if you look at this, all of this timberage here, and, and even the railroad ties, they're all just logs. They're not even sawn. They're not pressure treated. These railroads have been gone for over 100 years. That stuff's all gone. It's, it's really quite remarkable. There's another trestle. The work they had to do to do this. And then that was the, th this was the biggest trestle of all. Um, now we're just getting into some pictures of them doing work, getting the logs out of there. Um, this is a, a section gang around Barn Pond. Again, look at those ties, they're just logs, still got the bark on them. But you know, the railroad only operated for about 12 years. So, I mean, they, they never had any intent on this railroad. This was actually a full gauge so that they could um, switch with the Rutland Railroad, but they never had any intent that the railroad would last longer than just extracting the timber. Uh, one thing I'll say, the White Mountains was when the logging railroads first uh, it went way up into the, the mountains, and they clear cut everything. And when they clear cut everything, they left all kinds of slash around. So then they had out of control forest fires and then they had huge amounts of erosion 
and there was great hue and cry out of Boston, and that's why the Appalachian Mountain Club got formed. That's ultimately where the Eastern Wilderness Act came from. Vermont's logging railroads, I have actually seen some of the, I went, you can look in the land records and you can see the logging contracts. They basically said you can only remove timber that's above a certain DBH and you have to leave all the rest. I would love to know more about that. I don't know whether they were progressive or whether they were just trying to protect their investments so they got some future growth. But the bottom line is that we did, Vermont's definitely had its problem with forest fires during this era, but um, the logging railroads in Vermont were not known for having caused huge erosion. Uh, there's not really, it's been, not been documented that a steam engine actually caused a fire here in Vermont. So the, the railroads were not as hated in Vermont, let's put it that way. But they, uh, they, they got a lot of logs. That place looks pretty barren, but it might just be because it's along the side of the track. Now there you can see the railroad ties are actually square. Um, but that was a trunk line. There in the background you can see uh, Bourne Pond. There's, um, you know, there's the track crew, there's a little bit of a little work crew car. Probably, but they also rolled them onto the cars. They, they were kind of up above and rolled them down. But all of the, uh, you, you'll see a slide along here, all of the, they, they didn't have trucks back then, so all of the wood came by horse. And actually, you know, I mentioned earlier about how it was difficult to um, uh, farm uh, the Deerfield River Railroad, which is not this one, it's the one I talked about earlier. They actually had a comp company farm in Somerset where they tried to raise food for the crews and where they tried to raise hay for the horses. Um, here uh, in uh, the Rye, Lye, uh, yeah, Lye Brook Railroad, they just brought it all up by train. See, uh, maybe this even answers your question. You know, they put a ramp out here and they got guys there and they just seem to be pushing those logs across. But I'm not an expert on that, so I don't know. You'd think that they would have horses do it too. There's my slide. And not only that, that's not a generic horse picture. It actually, the caption actually says Rich Lumber Company horses. So, um, that's how they moved most of it in the winter. They were yeah. displays with horses. And right. Position. And you're absolutely right. While the railroads did some activity in the summer, they did the majority of their work in the, summer, in the winter. And it's partly because it was easier to drag the logs. Yeah. And the ground was frozen, because a lot of that terrain up there could be very soupy. Let me see. All right, now we're getting down to the actual lumber yard in Richville. Some of you may know Richville. It's a little uh, neighborhood of Manchester. Uh, they cut quite a bit of wood. That was the whole goal, very much an extraction mentality. Um, you can see that, you know, they've got a walkway and the rails on the side. Uh, they had a log pond and, um, you know, they'd roll the logs down and they'd go off into the pond. There's another shot of the log pond. Um, it was all oriented towards, well, they were maximizing their, their investment, no question about it. What happened to the Rich Lumber Company is what happens to so many businesses uh, early in the, it's either flooding or it's fire. And in this case, um, the night watchman, from what I've read, saw a fire, put out the alarm, but you know, it wasn't back in the days when they had walkie talkies and fire trucks and whatever else, and it was a lumber yard. So it caught on fire. Um, the other thing that's fascinating about the Rich Lumber Company, I told you that they had been very successful logging in the Adirondacks. They were brought in by Manchester interests who wanted this business to go through Manchester. Um, they had quite a job getting up to the East Mountain Plateau, but when they actually started logging it, they found out the estimates of how much timber were there were 25 to 30% off. 
that, and you know, to lose a quarter to a third of your volume is pretty devastating. So when this fire occurred, they just basically said, it's not even worth rebuilding the mill, we're just gonna shut down and we're gonna quit. Oh, shucks. Oh, there it is, okay. Must be just how my computer is talking to the system here. Uh, some of the earlier pictures showed Moore's Landing, that's what it looks like today. Uh, it's not even a marked trail, hiking trail today, but you can, it is still there. Um, these pictures don't represent too much, except I can just tell you that it doesn't look like a railroad today. Uh, it, it's all completely grown over. You can see some evidences of where they did the cuts and fills, but it is, uh, it is a rough slog. Um, first of all, wherever the, any of those trestles were, you'd have to clamber way down in a valley and back up. Uh, the brush is very thick. Um, it's, 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 um, it's not something you would take on lightly. Um, around Bourne Pond, you can still, if you are on the Lye Brook Trail, you can still see some railroad ties, and uh, I'm, I'm assuming you can see that with the picture. There's one there, one there, one there, but pretty, pretty faint. The, uh, the spikes in the rails were valuable, so they pulled them up and took them. Um, I mentioned that I have not uh, seen any spikes on the Deerfield River or uh, the uh, Lye Brook Trail, or Lye Brook Railroad, and yet one of the, one of you here was saying to me, well, you can see them on the Glastonbury Mountain Rail Line, and that's true. Yeah. Um, that one, they, like they just, they just the, you know, the trolley line, they just abandoned it and walked away. They did not take the rails out. Okay. You know, again, if you're looking for those railroad beds, this is what you're going to see. Not going to be a lot. But here, you know, I, I know cameras don't catch it, but it, it you know, there's a cut bank and a, and a treadway. Um, the rail line went through a number of beaver meadows. Lybrook Meadow is the biggest one. Uh, they just threw a bunch of rubble in there, I mean wood and everything else, to put, to put the rail line on, and so this, these trees right here, the, the rail line's going right here, and it's built up enough that these trees grow here, but on either side it's, it's still uh, too wet for trees to grow, so I mean that's, that's what it is. And uh, I look pretty bedraggled there, we, we, we went, and again I say we, it's Lee Allen and me, we went through muck up to our knees. In fact, one time I fell up into my waist, I didn't even know it, and uh, we also been through some areas where uh, our clothes got shredded with the raspberries and whatever else. Uh, it was fun, but it's, uh, it's interesting. This is the only picture I have found yet from the Green Mountain Club archives about uh, a hiker on uh, a bridge, and you can see this is 1921, and that's, what's, that's, that's all that really is left. This is the one point on the long trail where you actually intersect with a logging railroad today. And this is uh, the Richfield or, or Lybrook uh, Railroad and, and this was a crossing point for the bridge. And so our trail bridge happens to be at the same place that the railroad bridge was. But this is the only place today where you would actually intersect with a logging railroad. And that's it. I bet your appetite's just getting whetted, but that's it. Any questions? Yes, sir. Uh, do you know if that Deerfield Railroad, did it reach the Arlington Stratton Road? I do not believe it did. Okay. I wish it did, but I don't believe it did. Do you know anything about the uh, Big sauce piles. There's one just south of the Arlington Stratton Road on the Long Trail, right, yeah. and there's another one on Forest Road 325. Like, what were they doing there to create those piles of sawdust? The the original charter for the Deerfield Railroad was to go all the way to Bourne Pond. They didn't make it. Um, I said I wished they had. A number of people, not just me, have gone out and concluded that it ended at something called Smith Woods, 
which was south of the road. However, there was a very big logging operation that went for many years at Grep Job. And uh, that uh, Arlington West Warrensboro Road, which is sometimes called Kelly Stan Road, was a very major thoroughfare. You know about the Webster Monument where 40,000 people came to hear. Uh, who was it? Daniel Webster, yeah. Speak. And today you're like, what in the world are they doing out here? Well, it was a it, it, uh, Anyway. Um, there's also another very big logging operation called Dufresne Job, which is um, between Stratton Pond and Stratton Mountain, and they predated the railroad. So they were they definitely did get in there with uh, with logging and by horse and, and and they might have had a steam mill. I don't know. How did they transport the logs out of there on, on that road? I, I'm guessing they did by horse because it's, it's before the truck era. So I guess I guess that's. But I guess they did. Yes? Is there ever any cooperation uh, between the railroads and any other moving of freight? I'm thinking of like quarries, or did they share lines, or? You're getting out of my realm of specialty in that I've chosen to just be interested in these three logging roads that service uh, that, that we're that intersect with a long trail. There is at least one Orient Railroad that I have seen that's near Manchester, I think, on the other side of Route 7. Um, but I don't believe any of these railroads ever got involved in Corian. There's an awful lot of good stuff for somebody who had the time. You know, some, I, I told you I've given this talk before, and I said no one wrote the book, and they said, well, you should write the book. And I said, well, you know, uh, I don't know if that'll happen, but it'd be a great project for someone. Yes? The logs fell into the logging pond. Yep. And I assume the, the logs went down to a, floated down to a place where they were. Was the yeah, I, I think they used the logging pond to store logs and to move them, and they would go uh, to, uh, I think probably they had hydropower that ran the saws themselves, so that, you know, but I, I don't know exactly how they got it out of the pond onto the saw table. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah sure. That actually, the logging pond is still visible that Rich Lumber Company had. If you go down to Route 7, or the new, the new 7, after you cross Light Horton on the highway, if you look to the left in that field there, you'll see a, a, a radius of dirt there. That was the log pond. And actually, the railroad pulled up there, the tracks were angled, they would pop the chains, they'd roll down into the pond. But they used, there was a lot of men that would use what they call pipe, pipe poles, they had points on them, and they would, they would push the logs along, and actually the mill was above the pond, and it was a conveyor, a conveyor, a chain conveyor would go around and had hooks. And it would hook onto the log and it would pull it up into the mill. And it would then go on where they would run it through their dance hall mills. But uh, you know, it was pretty, pretty calm. But I knew there was someone here that would know that. <laughs> <laughs> I spent many hours on Richard Mother's company. Okay. <laughs> in, in researching it? Yes. A lot of times, back two days ago, I was just over in in New York. Okay. The town that they built, yep. they had 16 miles of rail, yep. a huge complex. And okay. they moved to Manchester after they exhausted that. You know what? You know, should have done this. this <laughs> <laughs> if I was able to write a book. Yeah, right. Can you write a book together? For that. <laughs> yes. On the Live Road Trail out of Manchester, going up to the falls, when you get to the cut where the um, horrible hurricane did all that damage, I was told and shown a photograph that down there in the valley below that, there is a cut stone building. Are you aware of that? And could you say something about it and what it was? And is it really there? That was the commissary. Has anyone, have you been down to that? Many times. Yeah. Ooh, I was afraid to go down. I didn't they, know if I could get that down. They had been there, and I suspect that was the business. That was the commissary. What? It was the commissary, so the loggers up in there could go and get stuff that they needed for everyday living up in the camps. Well, I'm impressed by the knowledge that's in this room. I don't know about that, I don't know about that either. 
And there were I'm two glad mills. I told you at the, at the outset I'm not an expert. All right. There were two mills. One burned. They built another one for yeah. That one burned. Yeah, I, I was aware that another mill was built, but not by rich lumber companies, by right. someone else. Right. I, I had seen that. Yeah. You know, like I said, floods and, and fires destroyed a lot of businesses, a lot of people's fortunes uh, were, were ruined, uh, and um, yeah, times were risky back then. Well, they still are, in a different way, maybe. Yeah, yeah. Well, the sawmill, yeah, yeah, yeah. I agree, I mean, sawdust to sawdust, it, it, it makes heat, yeah. One of the stories I heard in the barbershop uh, was in those days, the, the French, the Polish, the Germans all had separate camps. And on weekends, they would come down to Manchester and the tavern, the old tavern hotel was in the depot near the railroad station. Well, they would come down there and of course get blistered. Yep. And it only had one cop in town, so nobody ever got in trouble. So. Uh, <laughs> Good time well, for all. You know, and you're mentioning that does remind me from what I've read. Um, a lot of young men worked on the, in the logging camps. Um, what they attracted with them was they said, it's, you can eat as much food as you want. And for a lot of young men back in those days, they were kind of hungry a lot. So the, the fact that they could eat all the food they want. And then they would also say, you can save your wages because you know, we're giving you free room and board. And some men did that. They would work there for three or four years, save their wages, and then go get married to their sweetheart back in Boston or wherever they were from. And others would do exactly what you said. Their wages would just go down the bottle every, every weekend. <laughs> and that's true today. <laughs> <laughs> yes? Other than maybe spark or extras, do you know whether the, the line broke or any other railroads did anything to make sure they didn't start fire spires? Would they, would they run a crew actually while they have been through to make sure nothing was well, I don't know. I, I, I can only tell you that I said this earlier and I'll just repeat it again. I have read that there was never a demonstrated case where a, a fire in Vermont had started because of a locomotive spark. Um, I'm not sure if I know why, other than I'm sure they had spark arresters. They did work a lot in the winter, but I'm not sure if I know why. They, they added screens that smoked yeah. some shades. So yeah. I can see you know your stuff. <laughs> yes, sir. I understand as of September of last year that Brian Donaldson is still alive. Okay, and well then I'm sorry if I said that. He's in a nursing that. home in Bennington. Okay. I understand. I, I, I had heard he intended to write a third volume and health had not allowed that to occur. But if I misspoke, I apologize. Okay. To my knowledge, the other fellow, Bill Gove, is alive also. Yes. He would be 90 or 91. It's uh, too bad that uh, both of them couldn't finish their work. Yes? My uh, grandfather and grandmother came here with the Lumber Company back when they moved from New York here. And yeah. the light, uh, Rich Lumber Company built those houses in Richville and gave them to the, the foreman and whatever, and they were that. Yeah. And when everything burned, they started their own lumber company. My grandfather did here in town. Uh, lasted another 40, 50 years in town. Like I said, the, between the two of you, you should give this program instead of me. <laughs> yes? Yes, the Swiss back that you mentioned about Dyke Owens, still, you still buy the slum. Yeah. Uh, yes, my, my recollection of tramping around there is that they really had to chisel into the rock to do that, and, and you, it's very visible. It, it, it's completely grown over, but it's very visible. Yeah. You see from the trail. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And I know uh, uh, I can recall pressing through brush, and then, yeah, there's, there's those rock faces, yeah. Um, again, I, I just, I said it earlier, I, I kind of marvel that anybody could say, gee, I think we'll run a logging railroad up this canyon, it, it, but they did. Uh, there was another railroad in town. Yeah. Uh, mud, dirt, and gravel. Yes. And that went from Manchester to Dorset, the quarries. Yes. And then to Granville, and that was for marble. 
Well, the, the, the earlier, the, the, the person who was asking earlier about quarrying, that was the one I was thinking of. Yeah. Yep. And it was on the other side of Route 7. Right. Yes, Mark. So on the 23rd of March, Kild is leading a hike up my brook. And he's hiked that a lot, and he knows where a lot of the uh, ghosts are buried. I'll find a building for you. <laughs> so um, it should be in the news guide with his kinds of info if you're interested in doing this hike at that point. Look for it in the news guide. If you're a Manchester section member, it'll come out in the email the week before. Great. Well, I hope you enjoyed the pictures. Thank you.